So good morning, everyone. So uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Paul Aronowitz with us this morning uh, as our uh, Peacock Visiting Professor for Education this year. Uh, Dr. Aronowitz is a very accomplished educator, nationally recognized, and um, we really appreciate his giving of his time to, uh, to put on some workshops for the faculty and for the residents to help us really be the best educators that we can be. Um, I'll give you a little background on Paul. Uh, he actually uh, did uh, medical school at Case Western. Uh, he uh, was trained at UCSF, subsequently was a chief uh, at UCSF, and program director at the time was Bob Wachter. Uh, kind of, uh, Paul was part of the early uh, movement in hospital medicine, and he actually, um, uh, he was the co-founder and co-director uh, of the hospital medicine program that started at the uh, California Pacific uh, Medical Center in, um, in uh, uh, San Francisco. Um, from that, he actually went on to be program director there uh, from 2001 through 2012, uh, and he became really nationally active uh, in graduate medical education in internal medicine. He was actually part of the uh, Association for Program Directors of Internal Medicine Council, uh, and subsequently the president uh, from 2012 to 2013. Around that same time, he actually made the move to UC Davis, uh, where he and Donna Williams, our own, uh, worked together. Uh, and Paul uh, uh, was uh, ser has served as professor uh, and as courtship director there at UC Davis uh, for that uh, time. Uh, he's got numerous teaching awards at the local, uh, regional, national level. Uh, he was actually uh, inducted as a master in the, North, in the uh, uh, National ACP uh, this past year, and he's actually joining us at the North Carolina chapter meeting of the ACP uh, coming up uh, you know, this weekend, and we'll be giving uh, presentations there. Um, throughout his time here, he is uh, you know, delivering a number of workshops to help uh, develop residents and faculty in education. I'm really looking forward to his, uh, his take on uh, you know, inpatient rounding in the inpatient setting, um, you know, for teaching rounds uh, and how we can uh, maybe think and reflect on what we're doing and, and improve as we go forward. So uh, I'll, I'll welcome Paul to the podium and join me in doing that. Uh, thanks a lot, Hal, for that very nice introduction. I'm honored to be here today and excited to do this presentation. Um, so this is uh, called Educational and Efficient Attending Rounds for the 21st Century, and this was actually um, health suggestion as a topic he thought would be potentially helpful to both general medicine attendings as well as to subspecialists who are doing a lot of teaching on the wards. Um, so I'm going to just start at the outset by saying that I think that there's a, a basic balance that we as attendings try and strike as we're working with students and residents on the wards. And most of what I'm going to refer to here is graduate medical education, although undergraduate medical education is really tied up very tightly within graduate medical education and what we do. And in essence, you know, we've got the house staff trying to get the work done on uh, patients that are in front of them. You know, they're basically there seeing a lot of patients, doing a lot of the work, a lot of the heavy lifting. And as they're doing that, we hope that they're learning a lot, becoming competent, and ultimately becoming autonomous by the time they graduate from residency. And then sometimes there's us, the attendings. Um, this, by the way, was just sort of a generic Microsoft clip art that I pulled off the internet. But then we as attendings potentially can get in the way of their taking care of patients. But when we get in the way, we hope that we're not getting in the way so much of their work that they're actually learning something, we're supervising appropriately. And I think this is a very difficult balance to strike. We struggle to do this sometimes, struggle to do it well. Um, but I think if you keep this balance in mind as we're going through this grand rounds, you'll get more out of it. I think we all want to be this guy, Dr. William Osler. Uh, here he is at the bedside uh, in one of these classic 
uh, shots where he's actually standing there probably from what's described in the literature, listening carefully to the presentation that the student or the resident or both are doing about the patient in front of him before he interrupts. He actually doesn't interrupt. He basically listens. And then after they're done presenting, he starts asking his questions of both the presenters and the patient in front of him to elicit more history that might help in making a diagnosis or helping the patient. Um, we, we, of course, always rather be Dr. Osler, but I will make the argument that even if Osler was around today, he would struggle in our work environment to figure out the best way to strike a balance between not getting in the way of getting the patient care done, but also being effective as a teacher, a leader, and a supervisor. So my approach to this talk after Hal asked me to, to, to take on this topic, since it's not something I've spoken about before specifically, was to review the literature. I initially thought, oh, this is an easy grand rounds. I'll just read up on what the standard is out there in terms of attending rounds, and I'll come and I'll do a, a literature summary, and you guys will walk away maybe knowing a little bit more than you did before. Um, but what uh, ended up happening was I read the literature, and, and there's, you know, there is a body of literature about bedside rounding, about attending rounds, and um, what I discovered was it's not like one of the things, the shining examples of medical research that's out there. Um, I really agonized a lot after I'd read it, and I thought, you know, if I show up and do this grand rounds, they're not going to get all that much out of this grand rounds. So what I did was that I decided I would survey um, prominent educator colleagues around the country and ask them for tips. You know, and I just specifically said two or three tips on how to teach educationally and efficient um, during rounds. And uh, I'll come to the list of the people I surveyed. It was about 15, and I think 14 of them responded to my email. One, one I'm still waiting to hear from, uh, and I'm sure I'll hear from them any day now. Um, and then I agonized some more because I had to think about how to kind of merge this information, the literature, these tips, and my experiences uh, as a teaching attending over the years so that you could walk away with at least a few things that you feel like might have an impact on how you're doing your attending rounds. I digested it all, and I'm hoping that by the end of this, you don't feel like I have just vomited up a lot of information and you walk away with nothing, because you guys all know from going to a lot of talks and grand rounds that potentially that can happen if you're given too much information, you walk away with nothing because you just sort of freak out, shut down, and curl into a ball in the audience. So to summarize about the literature, my observations about the literature is that there's a lot of literature that's basically opinions. Um, and these are in JAMA, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and <clears throat> just about every uh, journal that you could look in. And they're, they're basically opinions about what we're not doing well when it comes to teaching at the bedside, teaching the physical diagnosis that we should be teaching our learners. Um, and it's, it's a little bit almost distressing to read because there's not a lot of suggestions about how to change that. It's more like all the places that we're potentially going wrong with our teaching. Um, so I read all those things, and they are very interesting to read with titles like, if Osler were one of us, frequently a lot of referrals, they always start the article with a quote from Osler because uh, he was such a quotable kind of guy. Um, and then the research that's been done on attending rounds tends to be sort of semi-qualitative research. It's a lot of surveys of you know, patients, students, residents, trying to get at what works the best. But I have to say that there's not a lot of really hard data about what works and improves outcomes in terms of how our residents and students are learning. And as a result, despite doing this since the first residency started in 1889, we don't have a lot of hard data to go on. You'd think that by now we would have this figured out because we've been in American medicine, we've been doing it so long. And in Europe, before that, they were doing it even longer. So, um, and I will say that the sort of caveat to this is even if you've got a pretty solid study that shows good outcomes in the sense that it makes a difference, you're not necessarily going to adapt this. Now, so I trained at UCSF, so I can, I can um, uh, 
I guess, be realistic about their system. When I was a resident at UCSF, and this was 1989 to 1992, less than about 2% of our teaching was done at the bedside, which is pretty amazing because we had some great teachers, but they didn't take us to the bedside. And they just trusted us that we were good and we would figure it out. And it, it literally makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up thinking about like all the cool physical diagnosis, all the cool physical findings that I'm sure that I missed. Um, I don't remember ever describing clubbing on a single patient while I was a resident at UCSF. Was that because there was none? I don't think so. I think you know we see clubbing fairly frequently. So they did a study just a few years ago, uh, Brad Monish and colleagues, where you know so they still, as of like 2013, less than five percent of their attending rounds are done at the bedside, which gives you guys an idea of how far ahead of the curve you are here at Wake as compared to a lot of other prominent medical centers. So less than 5% of their rounds was being done at the bedside. So they did a, a study where they had the traditional arm uh, that they looked at of just rounding in the conference room, which is where most of their rounds was occurring. And they had an arm that was the intervention arm where they trained, and this was trained being 90 minutes of training um, at a place that wasn't doing much bedside rounding, but they trained uh, some of the faculty to bedside rounds. So they did bedside presentations with the patients present. They made sure there was a computer in the room, which you guys know is pretty key sometimes to getting work done. They had a whiteboard in the room where the, the professor who was rounding could actually do mini diagrams and chalk talks in front of the patient. And they looked at outcomes of that. And what they found was that um, when done at the bedside, attending rounds overall was nine minutes shorter as compared to the rounds that were done in the traditional manner. They also found that the patients, surprise, surprise, liked it more. They were statistically significantly more satisfied with it. They also felt that they were more cared for uh, in the surveys that were done. They found the attendings were more satisfied with this system. But lo and behold, they found the residents were not satisfied with it. They thought it was inefficient, even though it was shorter. Uh, they didn't know that it was being timed shorter. That was just their opinion of it. <clears throat> and the students apparently did not like it either. Uh, that's not in the article, but I've communicated with them, and they did survey the students, and they weren't satisfied with it either. So, so you think about it, like, so they showed that if, and they were averaged about 56% of their time at the bedside, that the patients liked it, the attendings liked it, so what are they doing today? It turned out that they tried to maintain that um, bedside rounding mode, and they don't do it anymore. It's, they're now back down to less than 5% of rounds because they could not change the culture of their rounding system. And as a result, um, they got rid of it because the residents pushed back so hard against it because their view that it was that it was inefficient, um, even though it was shorter than the other system. So point there being uh, that long-winded summary of that study is that even if you have pretty good literature to support doing something one way, doesn't mean that your system is going to adopt that. So the people that I communicated with for this Grand Rounds, and I'm not going to read off their names, but you'll see they're a list of fairly prominent educators nationally who do a lot of teaching in the inpatient setting. You know, people like Vinnie Aurora, Todd Barton, who's the program director at University of Pennsylvania, and so, so forth and so on. And basically what I said in the email was, I'm doing this Grand Rounds, and um, I need some help with it. Can you give me two or three tips for educational efficient attending rounds? And so what I'm going to do is, um, towards the second half of this Grand Rounds, I'm going to give you some of those tips mixed in with my tips. So you won't really know where they came from. But um, a, a lot of the tips they gave me were pretty consistent. Um, and I'll get to what those tips were later. So the roadmap for today is I just want to talk briefly about how we got here. Why is our teaching environment, our work environment, what it is now? Uh, I apologize because a lot of you guys already know what I'm going to be talking about in this part. But I think it's really important to step back and get some perspective on how we got to where we are. Why is it so challenging to be an attending on an inpatient uh, uh, system at most of our hospitals in the United States?
What's changed since 1889, which was the year of the first residency program in the United States, which was at John Hopkins Medical Center? And then I'm going to go over key changes in graduate medical education the last 30 years. Again, people like Hal uh, Atkinson know about these because as a program director, they're dealing with the rules on a, a daily basis. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about what we might be trying to do as attendings and rounding in the 21st century, because it's important to consider what our goals are. And then I'll go through these tips for educational and efficient um, attending rounds. So how did we get here? Again, you guys know a lot of this. You know, if you look in the days of the giants, you know, and, and this again is what a lot of the literature refers to is why, why can't we be more like Osler? Why can't we spend more time at the bedside? And you see him standing here in this very thoughtful pose, again, probably listening to a presentation at the bedside or in the lecture hall. He's actually brought the patient. The patient is so sick that they had to carry the bed in, and you know, there's these old steel beds. Uh, and he's got a resident or student examining the patient who's too sick to sit up there. And they're talking about the disease, and he's in that classic pose with his head tilted, listening to a comment that because he was apparently a great listener and also had a great sense of humor as well. Um, why can't we be more like that? And I think if you think back and you think about the changes that have occurred, it's totally understandable that we're not like that anymore. Um, the first residency program, as I mentioned, was at Johns Hopkins in 19, or sorry, 1889. And residents were pretty much, in a way, like sort of similar to today's residents. You see uh, Osler sitting here editing his very, very famous medical textbook, which for years went through multiple editions that he revised himself and was the internationally leading medical textbook um, for, for, I think it was over 20 or 30 years. So he was very successful th with this. But what allowed him the time, supposedly, to do this was that the residents were off taking care of the patients in the hospital. He'd run with them every day. He'd have them over to his house for dinner at night with his, his wife um, and his son. Um, but he was able to do this because of his residence there. So the attending rounds was mostly centered around the patient. More than 75% or 80% of the rounds were done at the patient bedside. You had the resident, the student, and the attending there, and everything was about that history and the physical exam and so forth. And the little bit of rounds that wasn't done at the bedside was actually done in the morgue because um, basically there were a lot of autopsies done in those days. Osler did over 1,000 autopsies at McGill before he left there. He had gone to, he'd grown up, he's from Canada, for those of you that didn't know that had gone to McGill Medical School and was on faculty after he finished his medical school and training. Uh, over a thousand autopsies, and then he came down to UPenn and then ended up at Johns Hopkins eventually. Um, so they'd round in the morgue because many of the patients that were admitted died in the hospital and then got autopsies. So they'd go see what things looked like post-mortem, and then they'd go to a, a big lecture hall and talk about the diseases that they'd seen on the wards and in the, um, in the morgue. So it sort of connected it all together in a way that um, we don't really necessarily do too often anymore. Residents in those days were called residents because they resided in the hospital. They either paid for their training or were paid a paltry sum, something like $50 a month. Um, they got maybe a half a day off a week, um, sometimes no days off a week. Um, they were mostly men in those days, and they were mostly unmarried. It was considered very, very politically incorrect to get married before or during residency because you were working 140 hours a week or whatever, and you were living in a hospital in a little dorm room, basically, in a bunk bed or something like that. Um, and then they were, they were basically 100% dedicated to the science and the art of medicine. So things were very, very different in those days. Patients had very long stays. Uh, they had high mortality rates. Uh, if you guys haven't read Osler's biography by Michael Bliss, I highly recommend it. There's this amazing description of his death. Um, he died in around 1919. They think he got influenza. Um, and then they know for sure that he got a Haemophilus influenza empyema, and they know that because they, they aspirated it and they gram-stained it. And um, 
he was quite ill, um, but he stayed at home. He didn't want to go to the hospital. This was in London. Um, they had pretty good hospitals there, but he knew that if he went to the hospital, there was a high chance that he'd probably not come home from the hospital. So they operated on him because his empyema progressed. They did a partial pneumonectomy and, and uh, removed the empyema, and he did better for a few days. He had general anesthesia in the living room of his home. And then uh, after a few days, he went south and became septic and died probably of overwhelming sepsis as a complication of the surgery that he had in the living room of his home under general anesthesia. So he didn't want to go to the hospital because there was a high mortality rate there. The patients were much less educated. Uh, many patients could not even read. Um, and there was, of course, no internet in those days, so they couldn't look things up and kind of ask us about what they'd read on the internet. Diagnosis and treatment was very primitive back then. Um, think, about, think about rounding on 30 patients in a hospital in those days. You would not be having discussions about which antibiotics had holes in them and which ones you should be using and which ones not and how, you know, how you're going to get C. diff from some antibiotics. And um, They had very limited uh, therapeutic agents. There were, there were no antibiotics. This is a primitive picture of an x-ray machine. This is from the 1920s. Rentgen didn't even invent uh, x-rays until the late 1800s. So it wasn't even like they, you were running off the radiology to look up the results of a chest x-ray because there were none back around the time that the first residency started at Johns Hopkins. So limited diagnostic and therapeutic things you can do. Of course they had more time to spend with their patients. Think about what we do in the hospital now. So just very briefly, not to overwhelm you with the changes that have occurred in healthcare since the 1950s to now, um, concept of indigent care has changed. These used to be the patients that residents loved to take care of because there were no Medicaid managed care organizations. There was no pressure to discharge the patients. Hospitals saw this as their duty to society to take care of these patients. Technology absolutely boomed over the last 70 or 80 years. Costs of health care skyrocketed during that time. Uh, insurance companies are demanding more accountability than ever before, and that's been a trend that's been going on for years now, decades. Managed care has grown. Things like the LeapFrog initiative, consortiums of employers demanding higher quality from health care. If they're paying for the insurance, they feel like they're entitled to get uh, good return for value. Length of stays plummeted. Patients got sicker and far more complex than they used to be. Quality has become a focal point of care. Uh, medical knowledge has absolutely exploded. What is it they say? A year and a half is the average turnover for new medical knowledge for a medical student that's just starting out. Um, patients have acquired the internet um, and so on and so forth. So I could go on and on and on with a long list of changes. What about in education? Because an attending these days in the inpatient setting has to think about these issues. They, they are not something they can separate themselves from. Residency regulations have grown uh, fairly quickly. I was a program director, unfortunately, in 2002. That was my first year. In 2003, along came the first major regulations for work hours. That was the famous 80-hour average work week after, you know, for years no one really seemed to care or notice how long we were working or how hard we were working. And then again in 2011, because the 2003 regulations weren't enough to satisfy Congress and society, the, the, uh, the famous 16-hour um, intern workday uh, came along as, as well as some other regulations. Hospital focus has become much, much more on throughput and the quality of care occurring in their institutions. There's more married residents now than ever before. My dad was an internist, and he, w he got married just before his residency started. And he and my mom lived, they were residents. They lived in the building adjoining the hospital. That was about 1954. Um, but even then, he said that it, he was frowned upon for having gotten married during residency. So this has changed dramatically when you think of how many people are in the couples match these days uh, in terms of the NRMP and the match that's coming up in March. Uh, 
Uh, more women than ever before. At least 50% of graduating medical school classes are women now. Uh, and life balance and wellness for both men and women in medicine has uh, radically changed in terms of a focus. Um, and then, of course, technology has exploded. And the final thing I'd say about this is that residents were before they were seen as this very cheap labor force for hospitals. And it was one of the things that drove the development of graduate medical education. Hospitals were paying, you know, whatever, $50 a month for a resident who would work 140, 160 hours a month. And basically, they put in all the IVs and they they draw all the blood and they take patients to x-rays and so forth. Um, that's not happening so much anymore in American medicine. It's actually a rule that the RRC has that internal medicine residents cannot do and are not supposed to do those things. Um, and there's a rule about scut work. Um, so residents have become lesser assets to healthcare institutions than they were before. And when you think about it, that increases the friction between, uh, say, a residency program director and a hospital that's hoping to get as much as they can out of residents, where a program director is trying to think about how to best educate those residents for autonomous practice at the end of the training. And this is just, uh, I think, a fairly dramatic thing. I mentioned hospital length of stay. Again, no wonder we feel the pressures we feel as attendings teaching in the teaching setting. Back in the 1860s and 1870s, the average length of stay is said to have been around 28 days. Um, and a lot of those patients never made it out of the hospital either. Um, and there was a lot less to do with them. It dropped to about 17 or 18 days by 1910. By 1993, it was down. This is when I was just finishing residency. It seemed like patients were leaving really quickly then, but they were leaving pretty slowly. It was about 7.1 days. And by 2016, the length of stay had dropped to 5.1 days on average for a patient in an American hospital. So just picture the first day is admission and the fifth day is discharge. You've got three days to maximize learning on those patients that are coming through. And of course, five is the average. That's not the patients that stay one or two or three days. However, just I put this in here because I wanted to remind myself that not every patient only stays five days. This is a patient I took care of a couple months ago who was homeless, and he asked me to go out and check on his bicycle because it was locked up to the bike rack outside the emergency room. He had been in about four weeks at that point. Um, he had uh, uh, tricuspid valve endocarditis from using intravenous drugs, and he had also had uh, empyemas because he was flipping emboli to his lungs and had this very complicated course took us three weeks to clear his MRSA bacteremia, and then he had to stay another six weeks because we couldn't trust him with a line to leave, and he had nowhere to live anyway, and he had no insurance, so couldn't go to a skilled nursing facility. So he was in about nine weeks, and it was great having him there because it was like the old days. I brought about 35 people by to listen to his. He had a beautiful tricuspid regurgitation murmur because of his endocarditis. He had one of the best pleural friction rubs I've ever heard because of his empyema. And he was happy to show us all these things he got. So he was teaching the medical students about his TR murmur. But he is an exception to the rule when you think about what we see. And then you have the EMR that came along sometime not too long ago. Um, good studies of, of time in motion with interns have shown that interns are spending upwards of 60% of their day on the EMR. Which, you know, you think, wow, that's not that bad, except that if you look at how much time they're spending with their patients, nine minutes was the average in one of the best studies done about this. And they actually had a range of 46 seconds to about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes was a long time for an intern to spend with a, a patient on a day. And some of them somehow, I don't know how you get in and out in 46 seconds, but they were somehow able to do that. It's pretty impressive. I guess that's the peak efficiency. We should have them giving this grand rounds, actually. This is our, our resident workroom, and you can see the residents busily you know, writing their notes. Now in our system, the residents are assigned little carols with a computer for the month they're on, whether it's medical consultation or gen med or whatever they're doing. 
And it's, 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 I think, telling that they actually have started putting Christmas decorations up in their little carols, as well as pictures of their loved ones and their friends from work and so forth. Like, who would ever want to leave the safe space of this carol in front of the uh, EMR? But that's how things have changed tremendously in medicine. So, so this is my self-rendering. You can tell that's me because of the balding head, um, along with the graying mustache there and the cross eyes. This is me on a good day on attending rounds. So in terms of uh, how I feel when I go into work most days that I'm on the wards, the things that I'm thinking about that are above me and kind of raining down on my head are work hours, regulations, information overload, <coughs> um, documentation requirements, uh, Got to get those patients discharged early so you can get those uh, patients that are sitting down in the emergency room for 18 hours a bed. Uh, competing with the EMR for attention, I think this is a big one for attendings on rounds. Like, are you just looking at the computer? Or are you listening to anything I'm saying? Um, and then there's this thing of making sure that the, everything gets done right for the patients, that our patients get the most excellent care that we can possibly provide them. And then the things I'm trying to do while all those things are going on in the background is including students um, in the rounds, making sure that they know that their presence is important to us and that their educations are um, one of our primary interests. Teaching clinical reasoning is a big concern. Teaching the physical exam, because we don't teach it enough um, at any hospital in the United States. Teaching up-to-date knowledge, which means I have to keep up on that knowledge and at least feel like I'm not detracting from patient care while I'm on attending rounds. Teaching new things, um, supporting um, resident learner autonomy. I want the students and the residents feeling like they're making the most important decisions on the patients and making sure po patients know that we care ultimately. And then. Uh, making sure that I'm, I'm not inhibiting or getting in the way of patient care. So those are, it's kind of a tall order. Um, and then, again, that idea that am I, is anyone paying attention to anything I'm saying because there's got so much going on on a given round. And then there's this. This is sort of when you think about how medical schools are focused on mistreatment of students and things like this. I'm constantly, you know, it's like you can be frontally released sometimes, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm not saying anything I'll regret, that I don't express any frustration, uh, which at times is hard to do, especially day 13 of 14 in a row, that, I, that I'm not irritable. I've picked up that on myself a few times where I'm just like getting really impatient with a bad presentation. Um, or otherwise just screw up as I'm standing there with the team. And, and this is all the things, or maybe just a part of the things that are going on in my head. So what are we trying to do on attending rounds in the 21st century, in the year uh, 2019? Well, I'd make an argument that the prime primacy of what we're doing is, number one, as I've mentioned, to make sure our patients do well, and then to make sure our trainees are competent. And then finally, of course, we're supposed to make sure that our trainees can practice autonomously by the end of their residency. So this is really the structure of what we're trying to do. It's what the, the ACGME says we're supposed to be doing with our residents, particularly in internal medicine. And then I'd, I'd argue that there's a bunch of other things we're trying to do on attending rounds. We're trying to role model uh, for our residents and our students. We're trying to make sure they learn something while they're with us. We don't want to just be wandering around nodding our heads and saying, that's a very wise plan. I'm glad that you figured that out on your own. I'll see you later. I'm going to go have a cup of coffee now. Um, we're trying to observe our trainees at the bedside to make sure that they actually know how to interact with patients, or if they already know that, to make sure we know that they can do it. Uh, to spark their curiosity, I think this is one of the most challenging things that we try and do at the bedside, um, to stimulate a spirit of inquiry, that if they don't know it, they're, they know where to go and find it, and that that's fun for them to, to, to dig up new things. We're trying to boost team morale. You know, when you're up at that 16 patient cap here on the wards, probably sometimes the teams are feeling like, well, I could discharge these three patients, but I know I'm going to get three more patients popped in there because of our geographic unit system. And sometimes that can affect the team morale. You want them to feel good about the work they're doing. And then my 
sort of thing is I think we should be focused on making sure that they're having fun while they're coming to work because they're here an awful lot and they're putting a lot of effort in. <clears throat> so how do we do all these things? So this is sort of part three and the last part of this grand rounds and that's 18 tips and that's a lot of tips. So that think of that bird vomiting um, for educational efficient uh, grand rounds. I think the tip, first tip that I would put out there, it's really interesting. I did these two workshops yesterday on feedback, one for the faculty in the morning and one for the residents in the afternoon. And one of the first things that came up from both groups was the imposter syndrome. Like, who am I to give feedback? Do I really know how to give feedback or what good feedback is? But I think this is very, very prevalent in our field. It, it occurs in other professions as well. It's that feeling that you think everybody else has their S together when in fact nobody else does and nobody else is feeling good about it. Sort of the, the ballerina effect. Um, I identify with this, this picture. So I'm no different. I'm, I am still haven't figured out why Hal invited me here, but you know, I'll, I'll get up here and talk anyway. Uh, so tip two is, to fi this is I think probably the key tip here, is you have to figure out what you're wa you want your attending rounds to be. Um, now, you probably were expecting me to come and tell you how your attending rounds should be today, but I think and my conclusion after having reviewed the literature and talked to a lot of people about this topic is attending rounds are a bit like snowflakes. You know, they come down out of the sky like the last month when you guys got hammered with this one foot of snow. Um, they come out of the sky and they all look alike, but when you look at them under a microscope, every single snowflake is structurally different than the snowflake next to it. And I think attending rounds is a little bit that way. Uh, none of us in this room, <coughs> I'm going to wager, are doing attending rounds exactly the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So you have to figure out what your attending rounds is going to be. You can take yourself out for a treat or even maybe call it a retreat, you know, just call in to Hal or whomever your division chief and say, you know, I need the day to just go take a retreat and figure out what I want my attending rounds to be. Uh, and you have to decide what your priorities are for your attending rounds. What are the things that you feel like you have to offer and you can offer up to the learners? And you have to adjust this to where your talents are. You know, what are you good at? And you know, kind of then make a mission statement or you could just make a list of goals as I've done in the past. So this is just an example. These don't have to be your goals. These are some of my goals with attending rounds. <clears throat> Number one, as I mentioned earlier, my first goal is to make sure the patients are taken good care of. And then my second goal is that I like to embrace thin ice. I've been an attending for 30 years, almost exactly 30 years now. And I like going to the bedside, not just because I think it's better educationally, it's an easier way to get everyone on the same page, that it's more efficient. I could, I could give you 30 reasons why I like it, but the number one reason I like it is because it's going out on thin ice. I never know what's going to happen at the bedside. I never know if the patient's going to explode or whether the patient's going to give one of the interns a big hug or whether we're gonna pick up some really interesting piece of physical exam or history that clinches the diagnosis for us. And that's the adventure of going to the bedside, but that's one of my goals. I, I try and embrace the thin ice aspect of bedside rounding every day. And then um, I wanna make sure that I teach the students and the residents to observe better. Osler repetitively said in his, or repeatedly said in his career that he thought the hardest part of medical education was teaching learners to observe. And that sounds like really basic, but I don't think that's changed at all since the days of Osler. I think that people don't necessarily see things that are right in front of them because they don't necessarily know what they're trying to recognize. So that's one of my big goals is to teach observation um, and I want to make sure learners learn something and have fun at the bedside because then they're more likely to become bedside teachers themselves and to emphasize patient-centered care. And then finally, um, my goal is to know what they don't know and to teach that. And I think this is one of the hardest things and this takes some experience. But if you go to the bedside enough with residents and students, you figure out after a while where their deficits are and what pretty consistently they won't know that you can add to your teaching that will shore up that knowledge that they don't have. And I think that 
you almost mentally have to keep a list of things they don't know so that you can you know, kind of polish your repertoire and teach to those things. So tip three is after you've identified your goals and your talents, you have to set goals for what you want to get better at. This is the part that we all should be working to do to study and practice. This is sort of the average kind of curve of most professions, and that's performance on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and basically experience to the right. And you can see down in the steepest part of the curve, that's where our students and residents are. And then as the curve is still going up, that's probably most of our faculty for the first two years they're out of practice, which I think is one of the biggest learning curves in medicine, whether you're a subspecialist or not. And then, unfortunately, we tend to plateau, and that's the point where you're thinking, you know, I'm just not learning as much as I used to. I'm not improving at the rate that I used to. And I think, ideally, we all want to be on this curve, the expert curve. And in order to do that, we have to be very introspective about things we're not good at that we need to get better at. And I think this is the part, in terms of attending rounds, that you can potentially do. So examples of goals to, to set, and these don't necessarily have to be your goals, things like auscultation of murmurs. Um, I know I, we had an interesting dinner last night where I was talking to one of our or one of your cardiologists here, and we were talking about, well, there's like echoes all over the place now. I actually like the fact that there's all these echoes because when I listen to a patient, I always tell the residents and the students, do not tell me the results of the echo. I will tell you what the physical exam shows, and then you can refute or confirm my physical exam findings. Fingernail findings, everybody has fingernails for the most part. And so there's lots of things you can teach around fingernails, differential diagnosis of clubbing, common rashes in the hospital, common odors. This is one of my favorite topics, the residents usually have not thought about this, but a patient with fetor hepaticus who has cirrhosis, it's really fun to talk about the science of why they have this breath that they do in cirrhosis, which if you didn't know is unmetabolized dimethyl sulfide because their livers can't metabolize it, so it comes out in their breath. Um, good criteria to use in medical decision making. I see a lot of hospitals, they just kind of pull out their phones and say, hey, you know, there's this uh, med calc, have you used that? Let's look at the curve 65. Does this patient really need to be in for their pneumonia? Or let's think about the Wells criteria. There's people that I work with that are like 100 times better at those types of things than I am, and they've chosen to get really good at that. And it's very useful for residents and students at the bedside. And then fun medical history, I think, you could, you know, poo-poo this and say, oh, you know, our trainees don't care about medical history. They love this stuff if you tie it in and make it relevant to the patient in front of you. We'll have a patient with pneumonia, and I'll turn to them and say, what did William Osler die of? And, of course, no one ever knows, and now you guys know he really died of complications of influenza plus H-flu pneumonia and an empyema. But they, they are really interested in learning more about medical history. Tip four, I don't know if how many of you do this, but I always email a one-page list of expectations to my team members one to two days and no more than one to two days. If you send it four days before, they lose the email or they don't read it. If you send it one or two days before, it makes them a little nervous, like, oh, he has expectations. I better take a look at this. And the things I list in there, and I keep it really short, is how I want rounds to run, um, what I like to do on rounds, what I don't like to do on rounds. I have in bold letters, I hate conference room rounds. So they know from the day one, Dr. Aronowitz does not want to be in the conference room. He wants to be out seeing patients. Um, and then I also make it clear who's in charge, the residents in charge. They're the ones that are going to be our guide. They're going to make sure we don't run over time. Um, they're going to be making most of the medical decisions on rounds. And I, I upfront state that to the team so they know who to defer to for those decisions. And then tip five, I think this is intuitively pretty obvious, and most of you are probably already doing this, but not everyone does this. And that is to teach what is relevant to each patient in front of you. This came up over and over from these tips from friends of mine around the country when I asked them for their tips. 
it was to teach only what is relevant to the patient in front of you. And this totally makes sense. If you're a resident and you've got 16 patients and you're trying to get through your day and get the patients discharged and admitted, of course, you're really just interested in what you can pick up on things about the patients that you're taking care of. Tip six, when possible, keep your teaching to one to three minutes. This came up over and over again as a suggestion from my colleagues nationally. And this totally makes sense as well. The things I remember from what my attendings or residents taught me were these little teeny tidbits, like the little, like if you think of a fish tank with the fish swimming around in there, they'd throw something in there and I'd swim up and I'd grab it and it stuck. If you go into like a 20 minute diatribe about causes of chest pain at the bedside and you don't just sort of pick a couple points to teach about, some of that, most of that is not gonna stick. Tip seven, and I think probably most of you in this room are already doing this, but you're probably not calling them teaching scripts, and that's to use teaching scripts. So uh, Jeff Weiss uh, has this book that uh, he did with the ACP called Teaching in the Hospital, and he has a nice section on clinical teaching scripts for inpatient medicine if you want to read some more about this. But so what are teaching scripts? They're basically just an area that you have that you almost, in a way, mentally pull out of your back pocket and teach about when it comes up on rounds. And so examples of this, and this is not a, a, a thorough list or anything like that, you know, your approach to hyponatremia. Of course, hyponatremia, probably half the medical service here has hyponatremia. And you have to be able to teach in a very pithy, succinct way about this topic how to read a chest x-ray. Uh, this, is, this is a teaching script. If you've got some students and some residents with you, how to actually hear a murmur. This is one of my favorite teaching scripts in a loud and raucous hospital. Now, I notice most of your patients are in private rooms. We don't have that luxury at UC Davis. Usually the patient in the bed next door has the TV cranked all the way up while I'm trying to listen to a murmur. And the, and the residents and students are always curious to know, like, how do you actually hear these murmurs? Um, so I'll just wax into this, like, 90-second teaching script about the best way to get good at murmurs. And to them, that's just like, wow, I never thought about that. How to differentiate different systolic murmurs in the same patient. Lots of our patients have TR murmurs, MR murmurs, and aortic stenosis. How do you sort out which of those is which? Uh, how to find the JVP using tangential light. Um, we were having dinner last night. Um, one of the cardiologists was telling me that his main focus is teaching how to find uh, the JVP, I'm sure the residents that rotate on his service are excellent at identifying the JVP, which I think is one of the hardest parts of the physical exam, how to read an EKG, how many CT scans were done in the USA in 2011. This comes up every day, um, basically on rounds. And if you ask your residents or your students this question, none of them will say 81 million. Now that was in 2011, that was uh, eight years ago, and I'm sure we're getting more CTs now than ever. But usually it's in the context of, I don't know why the ER got the CT scan, and you know, I'm not really sure. And, and usually my response to that is, what percent of those CT scans in 2011 were done in the emergency department, which by the way is 30%, which means the other 70% were ordered by us, the surgeons, the pediatricians, the neurologists. And so it's a great way to sort of illustrate the fact that, you know, first of all, try not to be too critical of what the people trying to care, take care of the patients before you did, but it's also a great way to teach about the overuse of technology in our society. Seven possible hand findings in cirrhosis, five ways to identify clubbing of the digits. This is a attention grabber. How many patients died from C. diff infection in our hospital last year? The residents, well, this is a few years ago, we had 35 patients die in one year in our institution from C. diff. Boy, does that get their attention, especially if the patient is in the, in the room, has suspected C. difficile infection. So I've just vomited on you a whole bunch of teaching scripts, and I'm not saying you should remember any of those, but the point here is figure out what your teaching scripts are gonna be and use those, and I'm sure many of you are already doing this. The script should be built around what most students and residents don't know. If they have trouble figuring out hyponatremia, that's a great topic to get good at in terms of your teaching scripts. This is one of my favorite teaching scripts. The physical finding here, this is a patient about to be discharged with COPD. 
you know, people look at the, these patients that we're seeing all the time, and you'll probably notice that his face is excessively wrinkled, um, so-called smoker's face. Now, most residents and students haven't heard of that, even though they've seen it probably hundreds of times by the time they get to their, the level that they're at. Keith Richards has excellent smoker's face. Here he is on the cover of Rolling Stone. Usually, they're still a little skeptical. They don't really believe me that it exists as an entity. So that evening, I always email them a copy of this British Medical Journal uh, study about smoker's face, an underrated clinical sign. So that we're surrounded by these great clinical findings that people don't necessarily know are there. Tip eight, never round past your allotted time. Now, I think this is probably the biggest one that we struggle with because there's such time pressures in the hospital. You can always go see the other patients. You don't have to see every patient on the service that's waiting placement or is going to go to a sniff at some point when they come up with a bed. You can go see those on your own and circle back with your team later in the day. And I think going past the allotted time is sort of the bane of a resident's existence if you're the attending. And you have to kind of rein this in and really be conscious of this. This, I'm not going to belabor this because I was very, very impressed on bedside rounds yesterday. I went with one of the chief residents, uh, George, um, and just had a great time meeting some of your patients at this medical center. And I was very impressed with the level of comfort of the students presenting at the bedside, the interns as they were discussing the case and making eye contact with the patients and making them feel like they were the center of attention. But I have to say that this is probably one of uh, the key things, I think, that just really brings joy to medicine. And you can see that in this photo. This is a patient we took care of who came in for new onset congestive heart failure. And I sent all the students who were currently sub-eyes or third-year students um, at, at, our, at UC Davis Med Center. And I said, you need to go meet this patient. He has a very interesting physical finding. And the physical finding was that he had something called a zabiba on his forehead, which is from praying to Mecca five times a day. And he had ankle calluses also from the same thing. And I wanted them to be able to recognize that when they saw it inevitably in another patient. So they went to see it, and he showed it to him. And, he was, and then he spent the next hour teaching, him, teaching them about the most interesting part of his his uh, medical history, which is he has Charcot-Marie tooth disease. So he spent an hour, and you can see by the end of the hour, he was so happy getting a chance to interact with these young students that he demanded to get a selfie done with, <laughs> with, with the students. And there he is um, in, in the selfie. Um, Tip 10, prioritize patients the team will bedside round on. This is going to be according to your own style, but uh, my thing is usually the sickest patients need to be seen as a team. The patients followed by students, we always go see them because those students are paying a lot of money uh, for that education. I want them to have a chance to grow and develop and present in front of their patients at the bedside. From an assessment standpoint, I get to see how they're interacting with those patients, how comfortable they are with the history, the exam, and what the plan is on their patients. Uh, and then if the, if the residents uh, want to see patients they have questions on, they're thinking the patient's ready to go home, but they're not quite sure and so forth, we'll go see those patients as well. We will not see the patients. We had a patient who was in for a year and a half um, <laughs> who needed to be conserved and placed. We did not, I must confess, we did not go see that patient every day, and nor did we need to. Tip 11, when possible, know the new patient you're going to see before you get to rounds. Um, I think this is probably doable in your system from what I heard. Patient gets admitted overnight. You can sneak into the EMR when you first get to your desk in the morning and read the H&P. And the reason I do this um, is that it allows me time to think about the questions I'm going to ask because things are happening so fast on rounds. And it also allows me to rehearse my teaching points, and it helps me to hear it again, because when they present it out loud, if I've read it 20 minutes before, it just sort of reinforces important parts of the history. Tip 12, I think you guys have this to the nines here, because most of your rooms have computers in them, but not all medical centers have this. Having a computer in the room is key to keeping the resident happy, because it's what a lot of these rounds are about. 
These are crucial for efficiency. They can be looking up new labs, they can be putting in orders, they can be pulling up CT scans. And it's nice for the patients because they can actually get to see the CT scan or the chest X-ray in question that maybe got them admitted to the hospital. It's also great for immediate gratification. So if I'm listening to a, a, a patient's heart and I say, this patient has a mitral regurgitation murmur or this patient has aortic stenosis, the residents, of course, usually they're like, well, let's see how good you are. And they look it up uh, and they see what the most recent echo showed. And sometimes I'm wrong. Um, and then they get to see humility because I'm wrong. Uh, so that's okay too. Tip 13, let the resident run uh, rounds sometimes. I noticed yesterday the resident was basically running rounds and George was sort of adding things as we went. Um, but I mean really let them run rounds. And this is, um, this is the crazy large teams that we have at UC Davis. And down in the lower left is Maria, our third year resident. And so I had arranged for her to be complete. She was the attending for the day. Literally, um, the team knew about this the day before. And I just hung out in the corner. And it was the most relaxing day I've ever had on attending rounds because she was the one introducing herself to the patients and asking the questions and so forth. And I was just jotting notes down for feedback for her afterwards, because she's going to be a chief resident next year, and she will be the attending, and she needs to know how to do it coming out of the gates into to chief residency year. Um, and then I went back and introduced myself to the patients and examined them after uh, we were done with rounds. Here she is at the bedside. Everybody's very attentive, and I've sort of folded into the background in the room. Tip 14, the art. I think this is probably one of the hardest things we do. Never humiliate a learner, particularly in front of a patient. If they've missed something, uh, what you want to do is inspire them not to miss it next time. And that goes for any kind of skin findings, historical factors. I mean, people will say to me on rounds, how did you know that? And, and I'll say, well, because I've seen it 75 times before. If I don't know it by now, I'm an idiot. And so they can kind of get that perspective of if some of it's just about experience. Um, utilize all downtime on rounds. Uh, when we're waiting for the other intern to show up or if one of the students is late or something like that, I kind of launch into little icebreakers. You know, what animal would you guys be if you were an animal? Um, what's the craziest thing? you ever did that no one on this team would believe. If you weren't a doctor, what career would you be doing? It's just a nice way to get to know your learners in that downtime between spaces. Uh, this was a boba break. Uh, one day we had a lower census than usual. We usually have pretty high censuses on our medical thing. For those of you that haven't had boba, it's like this stuff that you suck up through a straw and you aspirate it into your lungs. <laughs> and then you try not to cough because you don't want people to know that you just aspirated into your lungs and that you're probably going to be the next patient they admit down in the emergency room. Tip 16, don't kill trees. I think most of the articles you hand the people, they don't read, so email them. Uh, you know, have a little folder with all your different subspecialty topic articles you think are key to read. I send a ton of articles and I tell the, the re students and the residents, and if I don't tell them this, they freak out because they think I expect them to read all the articles. Uh, but send the articles and let them know that they don't have to read them. They can file them. They can read them when the topic comes up again. You can also send cl clinical questions of the day and uh, assign people to look things up. Be careful what you wish for. This is me showing somebody a clinical image on my phone, and then somebody snapped the picture of that, and I ended up on Snapchat with a poll, like, what am I showing the res you know, anyway. So it's like this cyclic kind of deterioration due to social media. <laughs> Um, this is another scene of one of my teams. If you run into an eagle in the hospital, get a picture. Um, tip 17, and this is what Vinnie Aurora calls rainy day teaching. Save some of your teaching for later um, when you have some downtime, when your census is a little bit lower. Um, go back, listen to that murmur that everyone nodded their head like they'd heard it in the morning, and you know that half of them didn't really hear it, but they're just humoring you and telling you they heard it. Um, talking with a more challenging patient is a good thing to do. Carefully examining a patient with cirrhosis. You can spend hours with a patient with cirrhosis going over their physical findings. And final tip, 
is that uh, there's certain things we need to cut our losses on. And one of them is, you know, there's all these articles about how we're not teaching the physical exam on attending rounds enough. I would argue that you can teach little tidbits of the physical exam on attending rounds, but the time to teach the physical exam is to, to have a different venue to do it in. And I'll give you just one example to close here. And that's, I don't know if you guys have seen this article from your neighbors at University of Alabama. It came out in 2007. Does residency training improve performance of physical exam skills? Very depressing article, by the way. Um, if, you, if you don't, if you're having a bad day, don't read it. What they did was they had um, interns on day zero of internship do OSCEs on patients with common diagnoses who scripted things. But basically, they were looking to see if they knew what to examine. And you can see that bar on the left side there is uh, interns week zero. The middle bar is interns week four. And you can see there was definite improvement between week zero and week four. The third bar to the right are the third year residents leading them to conclude that there's a possibility that residents don't improve their physical exam skills between week four of internship and third year. I actually believe this study because I do a lot of physical exam teaching and we underemphasize the physical exam. Now, is the place to fix this attending rounds? Probably not. The place to fix it is we started a, an elective a few years ago where I have two or three residents on the elective we do journal clubs on the physical exam and so forth. But the biggest part of this is that we go to the bedside. I watch the resident doing the heart, lung, and abdominal exam. I coach them on it. And the next day, they bring one of the third years. And here she's brought, I don't know why she got three of them, but she got three third year students and is coaching them on how to do the heart, lung, and abdominal exam. And I'm in the corner watching her, watching them, so-called observer, the, observing the observer observing. And I give her feedback afterwards about her teaching technique and whether she's teaching good technique to the students. And she's giving them feedback in real time, which is what coaching uh, really is all about. So that's the way, we, one of the ways we've chosen to address this issue. This was the first person to be on the elective, the woman standing to the left side there. She's now one of our faculty. And I love this picture because it really emphasizes what it is that those of us that like to be at the bedside like about the bedside. It's an elective, so she's just standing there. Her pager's not going off. She's smiling. She's hanging back. The student is struggling to find the point of maximal impulse. But look at the smile on the patient's face. She's totally enjoying being the center of attention for this teaching exercise. And this picture so reminds me of the timelessness of the picture on the left side of the screen, which is Osler at the bedside teaching. So I think that if done well, you can really um, emphasize the importance of being at the bedside with residents. But sometimes you have to do it outside the venue of attending rounds and in another setting. So in summary, attending rounds in the 21st century is remarkably complex. There's a lot of moving parts to it. You have to recognize the complexity of these rounds for what they are and figure out how you're going to approach them. Reflect upon what you want them to be. Uh, focus on improving yourself and your attending rounds, and you'll end up having educational and efficient attending rounds. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. I went over time a little bit, so I guess we take the questions up here. Or yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ranowitz. I'll open up the floor for questions. I see Dr. Rosenthal. Uh, so, Paul, that was absolutely fabulous, and I really want to thank you for your visit uh, on behalf of the department. Um, so, one of the things that you know really struck me, you know, from your presentation was the comment that one of the most challenging things to do is to teach learners how to observe. Mm -hmm. And you know, you showed the, you know, several pictures of Osler. Um, I was also struck by the slide that showed the, you know, holiday decorated, you know, work carol. Um, Abraham Verghese has written about, you know, the intrusion of the eye patient, you know, which is the, uh, you know, essentially the computer that's come between you know, the dyad of the physician and the patient. So I was wondering, you know, your thoughts on, um, you know, how you approach, uh, 
this challenge of, you know, getting learners to actually observe and, you know, potentially spending less time in front of the computer? Well, I, I think, I mean, um, I, my answer, I guess, to that is pretty simple. I think that it's, it's getting them to the bedside. Because, I mean, they're not going to learn to observe a patient by looking at Google images. They're going to learn to observe a patient by picking up an important physical finding at the bedside. So, I mean, our, our residents, um, I, you know, I have to leverage them out of the, the workroom. They'd rather be in the conference room. You know, they have, con it's, a, it's a control situation. They have total control over their time and what's happening in that environment. And I think we just have to push them out of out of their workroom, away from the computer. And it's okay, I mean, the computer is a reality. They can get a lot done if there's a computer in the room next to the patient. Um, and, it, and it alleviates some of their anxiety about getting important orders in and you know checking important labs that may be back at that point. But I think it's getting to the bedside. And in that sense, I think Dr. Verghez and I probably wouldn't disagree, so. Any other questions? Two words. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. AJ, did you have a question? Um, sorry. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Please Thank don't you. forget to fill out your evaluation forms. Thank you, Dr. Lonowitz.